Hello, and welcome to Glory Be, interesting people and how they pray. Each week, we chat with interesting people about their lives, their work, and how they pray. I'm Sharon Hanish. And I'm Father Vince Fernandez, and we're joined by our producer, Mike Malcolm. This week's guest is Bishop Condrela, uh, the Bishop of the Diocese of Tulsa. Bishop Condrela was born in Bryan, Texas. After high school, he worked as a machinist for a few years and then entered seminary in 1985, graduated from the University of St. Thomas in Houston and St. Mary's Seminary. He was ordained a priest on June 3rd, 1995, and worked at various parishes as a vocation director, and in 2005 served as the pastor and director of campus ministry at St. John's Catholic Center at Texas A&M University. St. Mary's. St. Mary's. Oh, sorry. Um, and then on May 13th, 2016, Pope Francis appointed him the Bishop of Tulsa, and his consecration here took place June 29th, 2016. Um, he has some great hobbies like carpentry and word working. Uh, Bishop, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah, since you couldn't find any interesting people, I was happy to come <laughs> instead. You are plenty interesting. The, um, of course, the Aggies would never forgive me if I didn't correct that it was St. Mary's Catholic. St. Mary's, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, I think it was perhaps in response to saying St. Mary's when the the uh, papal nuncio did so at the ordination mass that caused the Aggies to wildcat. Oh, which is, that's woo! Funny. oh my god! That's hilarious. <laughs> it is. I'm convinced um, everyone who goes to Texas and A and M, they're essentially in a cult. Um, yeah, I mean, you knew several of them at the North American College. I did, right? and then I, I did the summer camp, the Pines in Texas, and oh, I was that's like, right. five seconds in a conversation, I go to Texas A and M, and I'm like, okay, I probably could have guessed by <laughs> by the giant ring on your finger and all these things. Right, um, Bishop, what have you been up to recently? Well. Um, the you know all of us are navigating our way through the the covid world but in terms of our our practice of our faith that is beginning more and more to return to normal so mm-hmm. i've been going out and celebrating masses in the parishes again this past weekend i was in idabel uh filling in down there so um that is wonderful for me that things have kind of calmed down again uh, yesterday I went out to my little country getaway place. Oh, I haven't nice. been out there in a good three weeks, and boy, oh boy, is it! You know, I'm gonna have to get the tractor out and get some some mowing done before <laughs> right. the winter gets here because it's really getting away from me. So I uh, did a little <clears throat> a little pistol target practice yesterday oh, while nice. I was out there. Enjoyed that, and uh, today's another work day. Great, because you so you make it I guess pre pandemic. You made it a point to visit a lot of the parishes in the diocese, right, and to, mm-hmm. to go and, and just say Mass for them. So you in your first year, did you hit every parish in the Diocese of Tulsa? Were you able to do that? Yeah, pretty much each year. Each year you do so that. So the okay. goal is each year to visit all of the parishes at least once. Um, of course, closer in parishes, I see typically more than that. Yeah. But uh, for places like Idabel, to at least get there once or twice a year. Now, there's 77 places, and there's 52 weekends, and right. I can't use all of the weekends even. Yeah, the numbers don't match up there easily. <laughs> right. So, you know, multiple parishes on, on a lot of weekends and um, using Saturdays. And occasionally, you know, I'll go to a parish on a weekday for some event or something and and uh, do it that way too. So, But I think it's really important uh, because we have some – Parishes that are so small and in such very remote areas, uh, our little um, our little mission in Hevener, as an example, packed. I mean, uh, that place has got uh, tons of people. It's a really nice, growing uh, Hispanic mission there. But Hevener is you don't accidentally go to Hevener, you right. know? Yeah. So um, it's really important for people in places like that all around the diocese to see the bishop so they know that somebody still remembers they're out there. Exactly, yeah. (laughs) You mentioned your little country cottage, Mm -hmm. hermitage. Can you tell a little bit about that? Does it have electricity? This is a 67-acre stand of trees and ticks. That's that's the best way to describe it. (laughs) 
I had a similar place in Texas before I came up here. Uh, I had 31 acres there. I never saw a tick ever in 14 years there. Mm. But this is the Ozarks. And, uh, boy, we've got ticks up here. So 67 acres. It's out near. It's directly between Stillwell and Salisaw. Uh, It's mostly trees. There's about 10 or 15 acres altogether that are cleared um, that I keep mowed. It has a little 8-foot by 12-foot cottage, uh, tiny house, you know, people yes. call them, on it. Uh, I don't have uh, electricity hooked up at this point. Uh, there is electricity that runs across the property, and uh, if I ever decide to, I can hook that up. But uh, I use a little solar panel for whatever, you know, to recharge phones and iPads and flashlights and whatever. I have a well that was already on the place, and I've put a solar-powered pump on the well, and so that gives me water into a tank. And So it's a wonderful place to get away to and just enjoy being quiet for a time. Oh, yeah, yeah that's so... You know, when you were describing where it is, we have something in common, Bishop. I, too, am from Texas. Ah. So when you talk about, like, Salisaw, and I have no... I mean, and I've been in Oklahoma for a very long time, I'm like... Just nodding my head. I have no idea, you know, Oklahoma geography. Fort Smith and Salisaw are very close to each other. Okay. Fort Smith, Arkansas. So Salisaw is right on the border over there, and uh, Highway 59 runs along the eastern border of the state, and so it's right along there. Okay, wow, mm-hmm. great. And something else we have in common is that we were both in campus ministry. Ah, I worked at TU back when the Newman Center there was being built. Well, it wasn't with Father Tim Davison at the time. Wow. So tell me about campus ministry. You know, what was your, what was your favorite thing about campus ministry? But where were you from in Texas? Uh, Odessa, Texas. Oh, okay. Permian High School. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Home of the... Uh, you ever seen uh, Friday Night Lights? Friday Night Lights. I mean, that... Great. It, it was... I was back in the 80s. And she that lived was a, it. Yeah, I lived it. Oh, my gosh. Lived it. <laughs> yes, mojo. Out in the flatlands out there. Um, Yeah, Odessa, man, that's out in the flatlands. Um, What was the question? (laughs) I know. What was the question? It was about campus ministry. Like, what was your favorite thing about being at Texas A&M, about being with college students? I served uh, all together two different time periods, but all together about 15 years of my priestly life in campus ministry. I was the associate pastor for almost four years at Texas A&M. Then I went to do vocation work for four and a half years, and I came back as the pastor and was there till I came here. And one of the great things about uh, campus ministry, and I wasn't the only person I ever heard say it either, is that it really keeps you young because you're dealing with an ever-changing student body, but they're all within a a similar age range. Every year, the same age range remains the same. And so, uh, you know, watching the development of young adult faith, uh, many of them would arrive to campus having been involved in very dynamic uh, high school youth programs. And boy, they were really fired up and plugged in. But others... Uh, were not, and uh, they they struggled, and so providing a place where they could come and realize, well, this Jesus person is actually real. There is actually a real person, Jesus Christ, who knows me, loves me, desires to have union with me, and then to see that come alive. Uh, that was always so inspiring and wonderful. Um, we had lots of vocations from our student center. Uh, There were probably about 70 couples a year that we were preparing for marriage. Uh, One of the things that I enjoy about Facebook now is seeing all those uh, couples that I knew as single persons and then young married persons and now seeing the developments in their families and now there's three kids and then there's five kids and on it goes. Uh, That's always a wonderful uh, feeling of having been with them as they were just starting out. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I would say, I mean, yeah, St. Mary's is definitely, in terms of like campus ministries, 
in the United States is probably up there in terms of very successful, like very good at evangelizing and like a great, you know, vibrant community. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not the reality for a lot of Newman centers or campus ministries, you know? So what, I mean, what made St. Mary's different, right? How did they develop such a great culture and such a great, mm-hmm. like active faith life? We used to have a lot of uh, visitors every year from other campus ministries right. around the country. And one of the things we always tried to tell them uh, sort of up front was to remember that this place is over 100 years old. <clears throat> and this university has, at the time, about 55,000 students. And so the kinds of things that we're able to do here now after a hundred years of development and growth, and with a student body that has about 15,000 Catholic students, just at A&M, there were probably another 2,000 at Blinn College, uh, that provides a kind of a critical mass Mm -hmm. that enables us to do ministry in such a large way. So that's important to keep in mind. That's a big part of it. Um, If you come to a a university where you have a very small uh, campus ministry center, if it's not really personal, if it's not really reaching out in an active sort of way to get to know people, to invite them to come to events or whatever, then it's not going to feel like something you really want to be part of. The other thing that we were able to do because of our size and our development uh, we were of our age, was that we were a, a campus ministry parish. So we weren't a parish that had a campus ministry. We were a campus ministry that had a little parish, that okay. had sort of a small parish. And that makes a big difference in terms of how the students feel about their ownership of the place. Mm-hmm. If you're a student on a campus and the local parish provides an outreach to you, and that's the campus ministry, even if they give you a room in the local parish that you can call your own, it's still less. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, On the other hand, if you come to a campus and you learn that there's an entire parish that's literally run by and just for the students, then you feel much more... Uh, invited a much greater sense of ownership of that place and wanting to get involved and see it thrive and flourish. So that was something that worked for us at Texas A&M. So when they called you at Texas A&M and told you you were going to be a bishop, is that what they did? They just kind of, does the Pope call? (laughs) Yeah, you know, I think a person who has a really interesting job in the church is a nuncio, a papal nuncio, (laughs) because uh, you take the one in, in the United States. Currently, it's Christophe Pierre, Archbishop Christophe Pierre. Uh, I was called by the one before him, Carlo Vigano. Uh, part, a big part of their job is just calling priests around the country who have been appointed by the Holy Father to serve somewhere as a bishop and springing this, <laughs> right. springing this amazing news on them. Because they're essentially, they're ambassadors from the Vatican, right, to the different countries. That's what, I, like, a new CEO. Yeah, that, that, of course, is not all of their job. Their, their main job is to be the Pope's representative in a place. Right. But uh, given how much, how, given how many people do get called, how many bishops change places over the course of time in a year in a country as big as the U.S., they're calling a lot of people. And uh, it must just be very interesting yeah. because... Uh, they they try to work out a <laughs> well if you're the nuncio you can't call anyone without them becoming uptight <laughs> right yeah. yeah because there's only a couple of reasons <laughs> yeah, why the right. nuncio might right, yeah. come might call um so they try to work out a a calming beginning of the call hello father so and so how are you how's the weather there oh my <laughs> gosh oh my gosh um, I feel like that'd be worse because you're like, something is coming. <laughs> right. Please stop just like being around the bush. And just <laughs> yes. tell me. Well, they don't beat around the bush long. <laughs> they get pretty quickly to the point. The Holy Father has appointed you to be the Bishop of X. Right. Do you accept? So you could say, I do not accept. Mm-hmm. You could. Okay. 
um, do you, is, you would have to live with it. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Good point. I mean, either way, you're going to have to live with it, yeah. but... Um, there may be good reasons why a person would say, I, I can't accept. Okay. Um, and if a person has a good reason, then they're going to say that. But um, but you couldn't come up with that one. Yeah. Quick. <laughs> right. yeah <laughs> they I, caught you off guard. Most people are not going to have a good reason. <laughs> the top of their head, yeah. Yeah. But could you ask for more time care? Like, hey, can I pray about this? And Well, there's a very funny story that I had heard before I was called. Uh, I had heard another bishop say, that when the nuncio called him, he had tried to say to the nuncio, could I have a couple of days to pray about it? Mm-hmm. And the nuncio said, the Holy Father has already prayed about it. <laughs> Do you accept? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Thought, that's that, hilarious. That was a great answer. That's a great that's answer. Funny. But, you know, if you think about it, given given that it's a the, the process itself is one that needs to operate in extreme confidentiality, mm-hmm. um, for the integrity of the process. And so for for the nuncio to be calling people and then they say, could I have a couple of days? And then he goes on to call others and he has to get back to them. And it's it's pretty unworkable, I think. Okay, yeah. And so I think they they are counting on the people that they're calling to be people who are mature enough and rooted enough in their faith that they're going to recognize, wow, this is something I don't think personally that I'm necessarily capable of, but I know that God is with me. If you're calling me, God is behind this, and so I'm going to accept, and then everything else, will God will make it work. So you, you get this call, and you say, I accept, and then you hang up the phone, like, who's the first person you call and tell? You're well, you're, you're not allowed to call and tell anyone. Nobody. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so... Um, so your parents hear it. On the news. No, no. So the way it works is that um, there needs to be an announcement date. So you do first need to call the bishop where you're going. So I first called Bishop Slattery. Actually, Bishop Slattery called me. Uh, You do talk to your own bishop who already knows. He has already been consulted. He calls and you talk to him. With the bishop where you're going, you establish what's going to be the date and the circumstance of the public announcement in that diocese. Once that's known, then you get back to the nuncio with the date because they then arrange for that announcement to be made at noon in Rome on that date. And you're not allowed to tell anyone anything until it's made in Rome on that date. That works out to 5 a.m. our time. (laughs) And so, in my case, I mean, I guess guys do it in all kinds of different ways, I arranged a whole bunch of emails in a draft folder to go out to people who I wanted to contact personally. Uh, I called my dad on the phone that morning. I told him the night before, have the phone by the bed. In the morning, I'm going to call you. (laughs) And uh, Did he know why? No. Did he think that's kind of an odd request? Well, God bless my father. (laughs) At that point, he had uh, sufficient um, effects of dementia that he didn't question it. Okay. Uh, I said, I'm going to call you. And he said, great, that'd be great. Oh, nice. uh, He didn't question it. So in the morning, I sent, you know, once it was announced in Rome, I sent out all those emails and jumped on a plane because I had to get to Tulsa. I was in Beaumont, Texas that morning. Okay. And I had to get to Tulsa. And so um, while all that was unfolding online and in phones and whatever, I was on a plane. I couldn't wow. participate. Yeah. That's that's cool. Yeah. Ah, the bells. The bells. The call to prayer. As you know, our podcast is called Interesting People and How They Pray. So we're now moving on to the segment, How Do You Pray? So you mentioned that you have kind of a hermitage. Mm -hmm. Um, That might be one place you like to pray. But but what does your prayer life look like? Has it changed since you've become a bishop? It's probably, yeah, it's probably different. You know, I'm sure you have less time now as a bishop to... (laughs) I pray in the car a lot. Okay, yeah. 
Um, When I was in seminary, uh, the thing that I was most drawn to uh, from the beginning was a contemplative form of prayer, a a time of sitting quietly in the chapel, in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, with no uh, thoughts going on, just to sit quietly and to be in God's presence. Uh, that led me, and I was majoring in history, and my studies in history combined with that interest in that type of prayer led me to also discover the Cistercians, the Trappist Cistercians. This is a religious community that began uh, in the 10th or 11th century and was reformed. There was reform of it during the French Revolution in France that became the what is called the Cistercians of the Strict Observance, or their nickname is the Trappist. And we had a professor who was very involved in teaching the young monks at Gethsemane Monastery in Kentucky. So I got to learn a bit about Gethsemane and its history and became very interested in that monastery, discerned carefully the possibility of even joining that monastery. Did you visit? Visited the monastery, made some discernment retreats there, ultimately uh, came to understand that that the vocation that was deepest within me was priestly. And the monastic vocation, as the Trappists understand it, is monastic, not necessarily clerical, not necessarily a priest. And so one uh, question that was put to me there was, if you were never ordained, do you feel like you could fulfill your vocation, what you're being called to? Because if you come here, you might never be ordained. Right. And that was a clarifying question. I didn't like the question because I really liked the idea of the monastic life. But uh, that was a clarifying question. So I came back. But what I came back with was a sense that what I learned from the whole journey was this form of prayer, this uh, style of prayer. So... I'm a very introverted person anyway. I have a strong introverted personality, uh, which means I need lots of time alone to recuperate and recharge my battery and so forth. That's the reason why I bought the place in Texas originally, and I had the same kind of cabin set up there, and the reason why I bought the place in Oklahoma. So a big part of why I own such a place is just so I have a place I can go to to get away and be quiet and enjoy the uh, creation of God outdoors, to see the beautiful stars at night, to watch the comets fly by. All of those things are prayerful to me. All of those things draw me into a spirit of prayer. So given my schedule here now, uh, I pray early in the morning. So I get up Uh, very early so that I have time to be able to be quiet in the chapel, praying the office, praying the rosary. I often celebrate Mass on my own in my chapel at the house, depending on what my schedule is publicly Mm -hmm. otherwise. And uh, so those are kind of the main forms of prayer. Once the day starts, like with most people and all young mothers, (laughs) <laughs> Once the day starts, it just flitters away, and so it has to be early in the morning, or it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you also make beer? That's uh, that's a big part of the Trappist uh, lifestyle. <laughs> Some houses now at Gethsemane, they were into uh, fruit cakes and cheese. Oh, interesting. Really, really good cheese. Oh my goodness, it's good. I'm not a big fan of fruit cakes, but maybe we'll give them a shot. Well, so. their fruit cake has bourbon injected right into the fruit cake to keep it wow. moist. Sounds so like my you, kind of fruit cake. You though. might try it. It's pretty good. Now, Gethsemane is that where Thomas Merton was? Mm-hmm. So they're Thomas kind of he's there. kind of famous for. Mm-hmm. Did you meet him? Was he living when you? No, his grave is there. And, um, you know, when you go out to the cemetery, he's got a grave, but it's just another of the graves, you know, he was just one of the guys. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, was there a time in your life when you found it difficult to pray, where it was kind of hard to, and then how did you kind of overcome that, that difficulty? I guess I would answer it this way, that it wasn't that there was a time when it was difficult to pray, but there was a time when prayer did not mean much to me. Mm. Because my faith did not mean that much to me. It hadn't gone very deep. 
So even though I grew up Catholic, went to Catholic church and Catholic school and served as an altar boy and all those things, I was 23 before it really connected with me that Jesus knows me and wants to have a relationship with me personally. Mm -hmm. That began, that was the beginning of what I would call a prayer life. Prior to that, I said prayers here and there, but I wouldn't say that I had a prayer life. I was not actively, personally seeking to know him, to experience his presence, uh, to spend time with him. So once that started, I haven't experienced that it's difficult to pray since then. Um, But prior to that, I just didn't, it wasn't much of a priority. Right, yeah. Yeah. And that's a good distinction to make for, you know, the idea of just saying prayers and having a prayer life, mm-hmm. right? It sounds like the same thing, but there is there is a huge difference there. And, and mm-hmm. you mentioned the relationship aspect is, is huge with the Lord. Um, and then kind of the last thing we ask everybody um, in terms of kind of a universal prayer intention, right? If you could ask anyone in the world, everyone in the world, to pray for something, what would it be and why? Uh, I think I would ask that everyone pray that everyone receives this gift of faith in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm come to the knowledge that Jesus knows their name, loves them, desires to know them and relate with them personally every day, that that become the faith of the world. Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. Yeah. Imagine. That would be awesome. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, thanks so much, Bishop. Thanks for being with us and and sharing your wisdom and giving me a lot of things to pray about. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. Nice to be with you. Um, We always end with a glory be. So if you would lead us, that'd be great. Okay, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As As it was in the beginning, it is now, now, and and ever shall be, world world without without end. end. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bishop. That was great.